Hello and good evening, CSI 257 students for the fall 2014 semester at Anne Arundel Community College. This Packet Tracer tutorial is going to be on Packet Tracer 5.1.3.5, where we're going to take a look at propagating a default route into an OSPF area. And this is a pretty short activity, so let's jump right in here. So we're going to propagate the default route. So it says configure a default route on router 2. And if you take a look at router 2 here, you can see that router 2 is our ASBR, right? Our autonomous system boundary router. So router 2 is our ASBR. And the reason it's the ASBR is because it's participating in OSPF and these are the interfaces in OSPF and this is an external network right so this is an external network and it's going to be providing a route to get to that external network so let's go ahead and configure that now so let's go ahead and pull up and I'm gonna leave leave our drawing up there for right now so let's pull up router 2. And we'll take a look at the CLI. You can see that OSPF is running, so we'll go from user exec into privilege exec. And then in the global config mode, and it would like us to do, oh, whoops, I apologize, terminal. All right, so we're going to do IP route 0.0.0.0. .0 .0 .0. So we're setting a default route here, and we're going to indicate the serial 010 interface. So it says default route without gateway. If not a point-to-point -point interface may impact performance. So, but this is a point-to-point -point link, and so if I were to do a do show IP interface brief, we can look at serial 010, and you can see that this is the default route, right? Out this interface, it takes us to the 209.165.200, and our IP is dot .225, and this is a slash 27. And that is the interface that's gonna be the default gateway. So it's gonna take us from our network, which is located here, right? And this is gonna be how we get out to the internet. And we're going to go ahead and provide this information to everybody that's participating in OSPF. So let's look at our next step. So propagate the route in OSPF. And so it actually gives us the command. Oops, I apologize. So router OSPF 1. And I'm going to go ahead and say default information originate. And I'll do a question mark. And you can see that it only allows us to do the default information originate. And so we're going to come back to this because there are some options here that you may want to consider down the road that might be a little outside of the, the CCNA uh, curriculum that are probably bordering on CCIE uh, type design considerations, but definitely not too difficult to grasp and definitely worth taking a quick look at. So default information originate. So before I do that, let's pull router one up and let's see what router one shows. Go from user exec to privilege exec and I'm gonna do a show IP route. And you'll notice that right now router one says gateway of last resort is not set. So router one does not have a default gateway, which means that if the route is not specifically detailed here, and it looks like it, it's shown up here as being learned from OSPF, right? But there's no default route. So if router one was trying to send a packet to a network that isn't listed here, then chances are that's going to fail and so let's let's take a look let's see if I were to type in traceroute 
And so I don't have a route to that network on this router. As you can see, this trace route is failing. And not only do I not have a route to that network, I don't have a gateway of last resort. So I don't have a default route, which is typically what would be used at this point because the network 64.100.1.0 isn't here. So we'll do a um, control shift six to quit out there. And so now let's drop back to router two and I'm gonna go ahead and do default information originate. And I'm gonna hit enter and then let's pull router one back up and let's do a show IP route now. Okay, so now the gateway of last resort is 172.16.3.2, which is going to be the interface on router two, which is right here. Now, prior to this, we had this in the routing table. However, it was not the default route. So prior to doing the default information originate on router two, if router one did not specifically state that it was gonna go to 172.16.3.2, it would not choose that simply as the default. But now we do have a default. So let's see if we end up with a different result here. So trace route 64.100.1.2. And now the trace route immediately jumps to router two and then it goes out onto the serial interface that takes it to the internet and it successfully makes it out there. So that is the difference. And so what we're doing is we're basically letting the ASBR, the Autonomous System Boundary Router, which is router two, we're allowing it to redistribute a default route into the OSPF domain. And so then let's take a look here. It says examine the routing tables on R1 and R3. And so if I do a show IP route now, you can see that we have an OSPF route here. And this is very important. It's a very subtle difference here. Uh, it can be a very subtle difference, and this is very important, and a lot of individuals mistake the difference in the value behind an external type 2, and this is the metric type. So it's an external type 2 route. So by default, when ASBRs redistribute... Um, I uh, lost my train of thought there. When ASBRs redistribute external routes, right? And in this case, it's redistributing uh, this, or I should say it's um, originating a default route, uh, that what is going to happen is by default, it's going to be a metric type of E2, external type 2. Now, there's also external type 1. And so I've got the command reference up here, and now we're going to have to get rid of, let's get rid of that. So I've got the command reference for OSPF up here. And if you take a look at the command reference for OSPF, you can see that you've got a few options. You've got an always option, you've got a metric with a metric value, and then this is the option we're very interested in here is metric type. So external link type associated with the default route that is advertised into the OSPF routing domain. And again, so this is the external link type associated with the default route that's being advertised into the, route, the OSPF routing domain. It can be one of two values. It's either a type one external route or a type two external route. So as you can see here, the default is type two external route. And that's actually exactly what we're seeing here, is type two. Now, the difference between type one and type two is very subtle. The, the default metric for a type two is 20, right? So when it comes in, it has a default metric of 20. And if it's type two, if it's an E2, that value 
does not change internally. So if there were a, extra hops and extra costs that needed to be accounted for, they would not be accounted for with a type 2 external route. With a type 1 external route, internal additional costs to get from one location to the other are taken into account. And so those are added in to the value or the metric of the route. And so in an instance where you have a single exit point here, like we do in our packet tracer activity, right? It really doesn't make that big of a difference that we're using an E2 and leaving it as the default because there's only one way to get out of the environment anyway. However, some food for thought. If you feel that your network is going to grow, then there's no harm in using a type one, an E1 metric when you, re when you redistribute that route, right? When you are originating that default route, when it gets advertised into the OSPF routing domain, the best practice is, is to go ahead and use a type one external route because if for whatever reason down the road, you decide to grow your environment and then you maybe end up with multiple exit points out of your environment, it also makes it a lot easier to manipulate which direction things are gonna go. But if you have that type two route, the metric will always be the, you know, the cost is always going to be 20, right? And it's not going to take into account any additional costs within your network that it's being uh, distributed into. So hopefully that makes sense. And so you may be wondering, we looked earlier at the previous video I did on the uh, DR BDR, we took a look at the configuration guide. So this is the command reference. And so real quickly, let's take a look at how I got here. So again, you go to Cisco's main webpage, cisco.com. You don't need to be logged in. As you can see, I'm not logged in here. So this is publicly available. You go to support, and I'm going to choose networking software, iOS, and NXOS. We're going to go ahead and look at 15.3 MNT. And then here are the command references. And before, we were looking at configuration guides. So now I want to see, I'm interested in, in specific commands and not so much configuration examples. And again, an extremely valuable set of documentation that covers absolutely everything that you could think of. So Cisco IOS IP routing, this is the OSPF command reference. So if I click on that, we can download the complete book, which I've done and I actually just brought it up as a PDF over here so that I would more conveniently be able to search it. And so this is how you get to the command reference. And so we can take a look at default information originate and it gives us a nice synopsis of the command. It's going to give you the history of the command. So the command was first introduced in iOS 10.0, was integrated into the Cisco IOS release 12.233 SRA, and sort of talks about the history of the command. It even gives you an example of the command right and the default metric sets the default metric value so if you were running the full-blown iOS you should be able to say default information originate metric metric value or metric type and the type value and so that's what we would be interested in if we wanted this to show up as an E1 route and so let me go ahead and drop this down and make it a little smaller here. So I'm going to go ahead and pull back up, if we're still up, GNS3. And we did have router 1, I believe. Hopefully I didn't shut that down. So we'll take even router 2 is going to be good for our purposes here. So we are running OSPF. So if I was to say to go from privilege exec mode into global config and then router OSPF, and I think we chose 732. So here, if I said default information, whoops, default information originate, so distribute a default route. 
I think I may have been saying uh, redistribute earlier, but I'm, what I meant was distribute. So distribute a default route. And here you can see with the full-blown iOS, you actually have a number of choices, the same choices that we saw in the command reference. And so we would choose metric type. And if I do a question mark, you can see there are the two types. So if you're curious and you're wondering, hey, I'm doing this packet tracer activity. Why is it an E2, right? What exactly is E2 and what's the difference between E1 and E2? And so that's really the difference is that the E2 type route is going to maintain a, v a metric of 20 and that's not going to change internally in your network it's going to hold on to that value of 20 whereas a type E1 is going to take into account your internal costs on the links that run throughout your network and so how would you change it you would simply when you do the default information originate you would simply issue the metric type option and then you would choose is it going to be type 1 or type 2 and again best practices make these type ones because you never know your network may grow at some point uh, far beyond what you thought it was originally going to do and this will make it far easier for you to manipulate the traffic and do your traffic engineering at layer 3 using OSPF and the type 1 metric on these routes all right so let's go ahead and take a step back here to the packet tracer activity see that we have everything we do and so then let's verify our connectivity really quick so let's make sure that all the PCs can get out to the web server so we'll come here we'll look at the command prompt and I'm going to say ping 64.100.1.2 and as you can see that works like a champ from PC3 so we'll do PC1 and this should work as well so let's ping 64 .100.1.2 and it's working there and finally we'll check for PC2 and we're going to simply say ping 64.100.1.2 all right and that works great okay so again we learned a little bit more in this activity than is presented here obviously very short activity giving you the commands to run but what's really important is that you understand uh, not only what the commands are doing, but the different options that are going to be available to you. And a lot of students ask that question, why does it say E2? I see what that means when I do, on router 1 here, if I do the show IP route, you have the legend at the top. So I see here that it says it's an external type 2, and it could be an external type 1. But what are the differences there? And you know, how do I make it external type one? Why would I want to make it an external type one as opposed to an external type two? And so we talked a little bit about that. And so it's really important that uh, even though you're at the CCNA level and that you're still kind of absorbing some of the basic information, it's really important to have an understanding of some of the bigger design criteria. That way, as you go forward in your studies, you'll be far more educated in terms of um, the different options that are going to be available to you as, as you continue to grow. Okay, so this has been Packet Tracer Tutorial 5.1.3.5 uh, on how to propagate a default route uh, into an OSPF area. And hopefully you found this video tutorial helpful. I hope you take a look at the command reference. Again, it's a fantastic um, uh, resource and definitely uh, when you're working with Cisco equipment those are the definitive guides. Alright, have a great night.